Good morning, everybody. <coughs> We're going to be in Luke chapter 8 today. Yep. Luke chapter 8. Last week we got as far as verse 25. Um, before we get started, remind everybody too. One, that we do have potluck today, and a lot of food left over from last night, and then uh, Andy is still planning on doing, <laughs> apologetics, yeah, are you, are you coming up to get something or coming up to say something? Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm like, uh, all right, we're going to. Anyway, so if you've been a part of that, it's the last chapter in that book, and then we'll begin to work on something, plans for, plans for what's next with that class. So, Luke chapter 8. Last week we, we saw um, as Jesus had uh, finished up teaching at some point and he says tells his disciples Let's go across or across the uh, to the other side of the lake that being the Sea of Galilee uh, and on their way across they have a huge storm Jesus is asleep they have to wake him up and wake him and this is giving us some fits here lately It must be in my thing, in the pack. Okay. Anyways. Um, so they're afraid of the storm. They wake him up. They say we're perishing when they wake him up. Uh, in one of the other gospel accounts that says, don't you care? We're all about to perish. Um, and he's just asleep. So they're not worried about him passing. So they have evidently some idea of who he is. Uh, I mean, they have a great idea of who he is. They've seen many miracles, the healing of people, the delivering from demons, uh, and, and some other things. But uh, so they don't seem to be worried about him dying, but they are worried about themselves dying, even though Jesus is the one that said, hey, let us go over to the other side. So they are afraid when he gets up, he rebukes the wind and the waves and they cease and there's peace, right? So the wind stops blowing, the wind st or the waves stop raging. It's dead calm if we read the translation correctly. And so you go from a raging storm to flat calm, no ripples on the water. And now they're more afraid of the calm than they are the raging sea. It scares them when, and, and really, you guys, that, that, uh, it shows us the, the greatness of the power of God, right? That, that we can go from being afraid of a circumstance to when he moves in our life, we're in awe and really even to a degree afraid because he accomplishes things that nobody else could do. Now we have a lot of a lot of people out there who think that we should be able to do exactly the same things that he did, all of the things that he did, and that's just not not true. We see God, and you'll hear some very uh, very good testimony, very powerful testimonies of people who have seen a miraculous move of God in their life. Sometimes it is does have to do with the things of nature. Sometimes it is seeing somebody delivered from a, a, de a demonic possession. Some of it is seeing somebody healed on the spot. A lot of our interaction with God and what we see is Him quietly healing or things that, that God does in our life where other people can say, well, that could have happened without God. Why do you worship God? Why do you praise God? Um, I can remember sitting in a restaurant and, you know, I, I, 
I don't have great hearing, so I don't normally hear everything that everybody else is saying. If I can't see, if you're a distance away from me, if I can't see your mouth moving, I, I can't hear what you're saying. I don't understand what you're saying. Right? Um, although I guess I have better hearing than I thought I did because I just went and had a hearing test. So maybe it is a little more selective than I thought. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so... And I just got distracted by my own story. Um, in this restaurant, there's three people at a table, and one man is ranting about somebody at work who received a promotion. And praise God for it. Thank God for it. And was giving God credit for her promotion. And he was mad at that. He's like, I don't understand why she doesn't just believe that it was her ability and what she's done and the things that she's accomplished that gave her that promotion, that got her the promotion. Why would she thank God for that? And I'm like, man, the world and their, their insistence on we accomplish our own things, we make our own life, we create our own destiny, we do our own thing. We don't need God. God's just a fallacy. God's just... A make believe, just something for somebody to make them feel good about themselves or, or whatever it is. And the reality of it is, those of you and, and those of us, the, the church, when God does something, when anything happens good in our life, we credit God for that. Right? He is the one that creates the circumstance, He is the one who gave me the gifts to do what I do. He is the one who gave that young lady the gifts that she needed. It's created circumstances for her to excel and to be noticed so that she would gain a promotion. She is absolutely right to worship the God that she worships, to give him credit for her good fortune in that. And if we, if we do that, if that's the norm in our life, then that is also going to be the norm in our life when, when hard times come. When we lose the job. When we lose a loved one. When we, we lose respect for seemingly no reason. Or, or even if it's a reason of our own. To say, God is still with me. God is going to see me through this. And get me through to the other side. That, that also is a, a, that acknowledgement of God and his activity in our life that he has not left us alone. Even if it seems like he's being quiet, it might seem like he's asleep, but he's not. The Bible assures us that he's fully aware of where we are and what we're going through. And that he will, if we trust him with our lives, he will get us through. And listen, getting us through is not just getting us through a circumstance. It is getting us through this entire life. We do have another location to go to. We have a hope and a future. And it's in him and it's in heaven. It's in the new creation, the new heavens, and the new earth that is described in Revelation. And I know some of you are going, man, he brings this up every week. I try to. Because you know what? Every day the world is telling you there is no hope without our system, without our doing, unless you obey us, unless you do what we tell you to do and say what we tell you to say. And abandon your God and the ideas of God. And it is my job to remind you as often as I can, this isn't your home. Our citizenship is with God in heaven. If we've trusted him with our lives. We have a new, another place to go. Our mission, if you will, or commission, is to share the gospel with as many people as we possibly can. And to make disciples. Teach them the words of God. Teach them the Bible. So that they too know all the time, every day, when their hope is. Or at least if they are distracted by a circumstance... When a brother or sister comes alongside and says, hey, just remember, remember God, remember our hope and, and have that reminder to get their head back on right and get their thinking right. 
And it is good and it is right for us to worship God even in the worst of circumstances. They come from that, right? They, they are in the dead calm. They're still kind of shook, right? They were already afraid of the storm. They're wet, probably. Boat still probably has water in it. They're trying to bail it out as they finish going across. They get to the other side. And what meets them? A reminder of the real enemy. Right? Verse 26 here in Luke says, Then they sailed to the, to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on land, on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. All right, so this is what they run into. And Matthew tells us, because Matthew's an eyewitness of this event, Luke is not, Mark is not. They're putting together stories, uh, the accounts from other people. They're gathering the information. Matthew's a, uh, an eyewitness. Matthew says there were two of them. That there were two men there. One seems to be the spokesman for the two, but that there were two in these tombs, there were two in this position and in this place. This particular one seems to have the interaction with Jesus, though. Now, what becomes of the other guy, I don't know if both of them are delivered, but there is one who is, for sure. He's had demons for a long time. He lives in a place in the... We'll see... In the wilderness, he goes out into the wilderness sometimes, but he, he one of the other accounts, because this story is in Matthew and Mark as well, talks about him being chained, and he just breaks the chains like they're threads. That they would capture him from time to time and try to control him, and the people could not control him. To verse 28 says, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it often seized him. And he, he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the by the demons into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. So a few things to, to look at here. One is the response to being in the presence of Jesus. Jesus. You have those who are in the boat with him who are, are afraid already. Then they, they get out, and this is what they're met with. A crazy, uh, who knows what he looked like, a naked man who is just carrying on, and he runs up to Jesus. But notice what happens to him. He goes to Jesus. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, what do I have to do with you, son of the most high God? I beg you not to torment me. Listen, we in Philippians chapter 2. This was thinking about this today or last night as I was going over this. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says this, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee uh, should bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we think about that, and we think about this as a day coming in the, in the future. A day when will we'll everybody, everybody who's ever walked the face of the earth will bow all at one time and confess. And maybe that is what will happen. That's certainly the way I've heard it preached. It's a day to look forward to. And if you're a believer, and I've, I've even preached this, right? You're a believer, you're going to willingly go. It's, it's not, you won't be able to get 
down on your knees fast enough and declare this, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all fast enough, it'll naturally flow from you. But that those who have rejected him will still have to do the same thing. They will still be overpowered by the presence of, of, being, of, of Jesus, of being in his presence. And they will have to declare the same thing. But look at this in verse 28. His response, the, the, the demon's response to Jesus. What, is, what does he call him? Jesus, son of the most high God. What do I have to do with you? And I began to think, what, is this going to be the response of those who have rejected Jesus when they see him as their judge? What do I have to do with you? They'll acknowledge him that he is Lord. You're son of the most high God. But then the begging that comes after that, don't torment me. If it happens at the judgment seat, that's what comes next. Just as a believer has the hope, and not hope like I hope it's true, but the hope that Soon, I'll be with Jesus in paradise, not even in paradise, in the new heavens and the new earth, that we'll see our end, which is a new beginning. That we'll see that with Him. We look forward to that. In the same way that that will last for an eternity, in the same way, the torture and torment of hell will last for an eternity. What will they say? What do they say when they see him? The Bible tells us, says, appointed once for every man to die and then the judgment. Now, the pit. They begged him that he would not command him to go into the abyss or the abuso. This is a bottomless pit. This is mentioned in Revelation as well. This is the place where Satan will be locked up for a thousand years as Jesus reigns on this earth for a thousand years after the tribulation time. Many think that because a bottomless pit just means there is no top, there is no bottom. There's there's nothing that you have to... To be in that kind of place, you have to be in the middle of something. And so some say the bottomless pit is really in the middle of the earth. That may be, or maybe it's a spiritual place, I don't know. But it is a place where they don't want to go. For them, it's a place of torment. For that thousand years that Satan himself will be locked up there, he won't just be floating around waiting for the thousand years to get over and come back. He'll be in a place of torment for himself. And even in the very end, in the lake of fire, the Bible tells us that is created for Satan and the angels that followed him. Now it also becomes the place for the people who have rejected him. But it wasn't created for people. It was created for Satan and his angels. The ones who had rebelled against God to begin with. Don't put us there. Don't bind us up. Don't. Right? Please don't do that to us. Don't torment us. It's not time yet anyways. You're, you're here early. To be in his presence. The demons that you're here early. man. You're, it's not time for us to go yet. Right? <clears throat> And yet he says, or Luke says, this is before he command, <clears throat> sorry, he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. So he had not told them where to go. This isn't because it was hard for Jesus to cast a demon out of a man. He hadn't told them, he hadn't given them the place to go yet. And it just assumes you're going to send me to a place of torment. Like, my time is up already. Okay. 
this demon it also says uh, had often seized the man and he was kept under guard so people guarded him to make sure everybody wanted to know where he was all the time right? you need to know if it's if it's, if there's a safe passage through the area so they kept guards on this man they tried to bind him with the chains and the shackles but he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness this thing had complete control of his life. Whatever he did, however he was opened up to this possession, what had possessed him, what he opened himself up to, controlled every aspect of his life. This man didn't care that he was naked. He didn't care that he acted crazy. He didn't have the ability to care. He was completely dominated by the demons. And then verse 30, it says, Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons have entered him. Now somebody made a good point that Jesus probably wasn't necessarily talking to the demon, but to the man. What is your name? But he doesn't even get to say his own name. The demon speaks up, and it's not just one demon. It's which, whichever one is the spokesperson for all of the demons. Many had moved in. They call themselves legion. That's over 6,000. If you take the size of a Roman legion, it's over 6,000 people. Now, does that mean there were 6,000 demons in him? Not necessarily. Just a lot. Just a lot. And so... People will take this as a formula to cast a demon out of somebody. You have to name the demon. You have to get the demon to say its name, or you have to name the demon. But you notice this demon didn't give a specific name, did he? He didn't say, we're the demon of alcoholism, or we're the demon of this, or we're the demon of that. He gave a general answer. Legion. There's a lot of us here. Formulas for casting out demons, formulas for getting healings, for, they're not in the Bible. Where your faith, formulas for faith, right? We've already seen many different kinds of faith that brought healings from Jesus just in Luke, and we're only in chapter 8. We've seen the faith of others who bring their friend to Jesus and he's healed. We've seen the faith of a Roman who had a servant who was sick and said, you don't have to come all the way to my house. Just say the word. And we've seen, in general, many brought their sick or those who were demon-possessed to Jesus and he healed them or he delivered them. There's not a formula. But we have many in the church who, who want to say there's formulas. And in this case, listen, if you talk to a demon, you want to talk to somebody who's really possessed, you're on the verge of a lot of trouble. Even Satan, Jude tells us that even Satan, when he was arguing with Michael over the body of Moses, that Michael didn't bring any accusation, he didn't call him a scoundrel, he didn't tell him where to go, all he said was the Lord rebuke you. And Satan had to let go. The idea that we have to have a name is ridiculous. It's not anywhere where we have to know the name of the spirit that we're dealing with. There's one name you have to know. You really need to know in that circumstance. And that name is Jesus. It is the name given above every name. The name that brings salvation to a person. It is not the name of Satan. It is not the name of Michael. It is not the name of Gabriel or any other angel, good or bad. It is not the name of a saint. It is not the name of an Old Testament prophet. We do not get salvation from any other name but through Jesus and him alone. And this man's deliverance did not come through anybody but Jesus and his command. 
even after Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts, the, the apostles and Paul and anybody else who heals anybody is very quick to give all the credit to God, all the credit to Jesus. And they take the opportunities when those things happen, when the miraculous does happen, to share the gospel. Right? When Peter and James and John interact with a man at the gate called Beautiful on their way into the temple. We'll get into Acts when we're done with Luke, if we get done with Luke before the Lord comes back. Um, when, when they interact with him, he's, he's calling for, for alms. He's not even asking to be healed. He just, I need some money. He's at the, te at the temple gate begging, which was normal for somebody who, who was... Uh, crippled. And Peter looks at him and says, I don't have silver or gold. I don't have either one of those. But what I do have, I'm going to give you in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And it says the man got up and went walking and leaping and praising Peter and John. No, nope. walking and leaping and praising God. We don't have to go to a specific healer to be healed. Listen, I would be what you would classify as a charismatic because I believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. But one of the things that bothered me the most about the Brownsville thing was that you had to go from wherever you live down there to get the Spirit and to get the anointing and then take it back to your church. Well, how does that work? First of all, the Spirit is everywhere. We don't go anywhere without God. There's no place we can hide from Him. We can't hide our secret activities from Him. Everything that is not known will be made known, the Bible tells us. Because God already knows it. In Psalm 139. Just read Psalm 139, go ahead. Psalm 139, starting with verse 1, says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting, am I sitting down and my rising up? You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of, of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the, the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide uh, from you, nor the night, sh but the night shines as, as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame has not hidden from you, or was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for, the, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. I do not hate them, O Lord. 
Or do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count, my enem I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You see the understanding that God knows you better than you know yourself. He knew all of your days, according to that psalmist, before one even began. He knew all of your days, he knows all of our days, before we were conceived. And he saw us as we began to develop in the womb. He sees all of it. He knows all of our days, he knows all of our thoughts, he knows all of our words. One of the things that used to freak out the first youth group I ever taught was, was that idea. That there is nothing that you do in secret that you don't do in front of God. But that shouldn't just freak out youth groups. That should freak out all of us. There is nothing you do in a hidden place, in the secret, that nobody knows about. Not even anything that you think about that God doesn't know. He knew who this demon was. He knew how many were in this man. He didn't ask him his name. He was asking the man's name. But the man was not allowed to speak yet. We do not have to go to a special place. Listen, it's great to go to special places. I'm not telling you, if you can go to Israel, go to Israel. It'll change your life, from what I understand. It changes the way you see the Bible. I've not been there. The closest to that is to go to the, that I've been. It was the last fall when we went to the ark. And I was excited about seeing it. But you can't see it from the parking lot. This just creates more excitement for me, right? And we came around the corner. In the, you know, they put you on a bus and they drive you back. And I came around and I saw it. And it was everything I do to keep from crying. I didn't expect an emotional response to that. But man, you're looking at a kid who would have climbed Mount Ararat to go grab a chunk of gopher wood out of the side of the hill. Right? I, I watched all the shows growing up. I wanted to see if I could have gotten on some kind of expedition to go and look, I would have done it. That's the closest I'm going to be to it. But listen, that art doesn't make my faith stronger. Even if I was in Turkey on the side of a hill and saw it and knew that's what it was, it wouldn't make my faith Stronger. It wouldn't make my salvation more sure. If I never see it, I'm going to be okay. I still believe. It's why I believe we don't have a chunk of the cross. There are people who claim they do, but I don't believe we do. There are many places that we can go and, and see and hope to see. But pilgrimages don't make us Christians. Believing in the one name, the name of Jesus, that's the thing that changes our life. And that is what we all need. So back to this in Luke, says, verse 31 says, They begged him not. Uh, that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. And the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place and into the lake and drowned. And when those who fed them saw what happened, they fled and told it to the city in the and in the country. Then they went out to see and see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had de from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. <laughs> They've been afraid of this guy all this time. 
They have tried to catch him and chain him up. That didn't work. They try to set guards to make sure they know where he is all the time. And they avoid him at all costs because they're afraid of him. And they're afraid of the power that he has, the strength that he is, the craziness that he does. They're, they're scared to death of the guy. But when they see the calm, isn't this the same thing only in a person? We, the, his disciples see a raging sea, they're afraid, the calm comes, and they're more afraid. These people are afraid of the rage of this man, and when they see it calm, they see him calm, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and it scares them more. And what do they do? Verse 36, they also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region and of the gatherings asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. We can't handle this power. You have the power to change a man. You have a power to get rid of the demons. You have a power to change a person from a raging lunatic into a calm person who can sit and listen and learn. We don't want any part of that. For all the faults that the church has had and all of the bad teachings that that the church has had, the real church, the church, those who believe in Jesus, those who who believe he does change lives. We've preached this for a long time, for 2,000 years, and as many as have accepted it and received it and have been delivered from whatever, whether it's their own personal vices, whether it's demons, whether they've been healed, whatever it is, and allowed him to change their life, there have been many more who said, I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to change. They're afraid. They're afraid of what God's going to require them to give up. They're afraid of what change really means. Change was part of a slogan for a presidential candidate a few years ago. And look at what the change brought. In a a country now that is, as a whole, like a raving lunatic. saying that the things that are good are bad and the things that are bad are good and we need to embrace that and hold on to it. And we don't want God and we don't want to change. And there are false churches out there that will tell those people, you can be a part of the church, God will love you, you don't have to change. We need to be changed. We all need to be changed. The Bible tells us that all, not a few, not the most crazy, not the most obvious against God, all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. Without Him, we are not saved. Without Him, we are not in our right mind. And when they see change happen, when they see those who believe stand up and begin to speak and make sense and have logic, they're afraid. The world's systems, the governments, they they feed on, they feed to their people fear and hopelessness so they can set themselves up to be gods or be the deliverer. Even to the point of saying ridiculous things like they're delivering you from God. And 
And it's found at every level of our interaction. It's just not world leaders and world governments. It's at every level of our interaction in our communities, in our families. They wanted him to leave. And this is what God does when we invite him to leave. And we're seeing this, the result of this in our own country. He got in the boat and returned. God won't force himself upon you. He won't force the salvation upon you. And then verse 38 says, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. We see this as one interaction. We see this as, as one thing that Jesus did for him. But we see these here. In the plural, that he told him what great things Jesus did for him. He didn't just cast out a demon and give him no understanding of the situation. He didn't just stand there and say, okay, go home and find some clothes. No, they clothed him. They probably fed him. He was sitting there in his right mind interacting with Jesus and with the twelve. Just a few minutes ago, he's, he was begging. The demons were saying, don't do anything to us. We don't go away. We don't want anything to do with you. Why are you here? Now in his right mind, he's saying, please let me go with you. And listen, on bad days, we all say that, don't we? Lord, can't we just go home now? Can't you just take us home now? We want, we want to be called out of here. Quite frankly, I don't understand why every Christian is not a pre-tribulation rapture Christian. And, and maybe their idea is, can we get this all started so we can go halfway through or so we can go at the end of it? Whatever their mind is. But on any given day, can't this just be done? Can I, can I just go with you and just be with you forever? And we get the same response. And it's a temporary response. is return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. You're going to stay here a little while. A little while longer. Go tell everybody you know. Go show yourself what God has done for you. Go to your families, go to your friends, go to your community and tell them what God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city. Listen, he was obedient. In the beginning, nobody wanted anything to do with him because he's a raging lunatic. And, and then... Before Jesus leaves, nobody wants anything to do with him because he's calm and in his right mind and he, the life change didn't make people say, oh, we need Jesus too. In fact, their livelihood of that area is gone. A herd of swine. That's not supposed to be in the land. This is Jewish territory. They're not supposed to be there. They're an unclean animal. They're not supposed to be making money off the swine selling it to the, the um, Gentiles. It's an unclean... So Jesus even cleanses the land. This isn't an easy life for us. God doesn't promise an easy life for us. In fact, Paul would tell, I think, Timothy, all who seek to follow the Lord will be persecuted. If you open yourself up to your friends and your family and your community in some way, 
you're going to be persecuted. Listen, we just wanted the Haggadah printed for our Seder meal yesterday. We're not even Jewish. We don't claim to be Jewish. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, observe the Passover to be saved, to be a Christian. You don't have to do that. We do it because it's a great teaching time and it teaches us and it shows us how Jesus fulfilled that feast day in every aspect of it. And we even get to see how eventually, because it's God has built into their culture, not just into their scriptures, but into their culture, things that will open their eyes when they do see him as a nation. We were told by the prophets that when they see Jesus, they will, they will mourn. When he comes back, they'll mourn for what they've done to him, for having rejected him. And the nation as a whole at that time will be saved. But from some of the things that we can piece together, we see that our first round, when it was taken in on Thursday to be printed, was purposely printed wrong. We've got them. They're in my office. They let us have them. And when Tracy and Hope went back on Friday to see if they could get them reprinted again and, and done correctly, during the course of the whole thing, I don't have time to go into all the details, but pretty sure, done wrong on purpose. Done wrong on purpose. Because it was for a church and it had Jewish content in it. If you open yourself up, you're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be persecuted in some form or fashion. And listen, as the days go on, it might be more. And it might be more violent. But at the same time, if we do what Jesus tells us to do and go and tell and share, we're going to find those who are going to believe. We're going to find those who want Jesus. The next time Jesus comes into this area, they're ready for him. They want him. They don't kick him out. They don't tell him to leave. You guys, we, we have to be faithful we have to be obedient don't whatever god's done for you don't keep it to yourself right? we've talked about this you don't you don't take a light and hide it under a bed or cover it up we don't we don't take what's valuable to us and we just hide it away he paid a huge price for us we've already talked about that with with sunday or with easter sunday with with the passover yesterday and, and actually the real Passover will be in another two weeks. We just did it ahead of time. But that whole week of Passover time, that season is coming, that whole feast time. This whole springtime, we remember the life that we've been given. Because he gave his life for us. And not only did he die on the cross as the sacrifice for our sin. But he came out of the grave three days later. So that we know. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians. We know. Because he's risen. will be risen. No other religious leader has done this. We serve the one true God. We serve the one who wants to give you salvation. You can't do anything for it. You can't be good enough to earn it. Outside of Jesus, the greatest person who ever lived didn't do enough to earn salvation. Even in the Bible, you have Joseph and you have Daniel. Two men, the only two men other than Jesus where no fault is mentioned of them. They didn't do enough to earn their own salvation. They had to have faith in the Messiah who was coming. They had to have faith in the God that they worshipped. And now they will be where we will be. Just like Abraham. You go through Hebrews chapter 11. Read all those names. We call that the, the hall of faith. 
Right. And everyone mentioned in that chapter, we also can go back and see the faults that they had in their life. And yet the Lord still welcomed them. The Lord still called Abraham his friend. He calls all of them. Even Samson is mentioned there. You wonder if Samson will be in heaven. I mean, if you go read his story, it's not great. But he's mentioned as having great faith. So, if somebody, as you share with them, well, what about this in your life? I see this in your life. What about that? What about this? So, yeah, that's all stuff I struggle with. It's all stuff I have to give to the Lord every day. It's all things that, that if you think I'm bad now, you should have seen me 10 years ago. Okay? Right? Let me tell you what God's done in my life to get me to this point. And one day, just like this man, it'll all be done. It'll all be delivered. We'll have a new body. We'll all be changed in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye. When the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him to meet him in the air. We look forward to that day. We long for that day. And it's good to. John ends Revelation with the spirit and the bride say come. And he ends it completely with just another verse or two after that. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. But in the meantime, in his other letters, in his other book, in the Gospel of John, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he tells us how to live as we wait for that day. Peter and first and second Peter tell us how to live as we wait for that day. Paul and all of his epistles tell us how to live as as we wait for that day. All building a longing for that day, encouraging us to look for him to come, to not stop. Even Jesus would say, when you see these things, after he's talking about Horrible things that are going to happen. When you see these things begin to happen, look up. Your redemption is near. We, we work with one hand. We war with another. And we wait for the day that it's all done. Just like Nehemiah. And yes, I believe God still heals today. I believe God still delivers today. And I believe with all my heart that God saves daily. So, don't despise the world so much that you won't tell them the truth. And find a way to do it with love in your heart for them. And it's okay, even as you deal with that, to say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Knowing that he will come on the day that's appointed for him to come. Not a day before, not a day after. So let's be found doing the work of the Lord when he comes. The Bible tells us he comes as a thief in the night, which means we won't know. But Paul reminds us that we're not children of the night so that this should overtake us. The best way I can put that is we'll be surprised, but we shouldn't be shocked. It'll it'll be a surprise, but it shouldn't be a shock that he's coming. 
we don't ever want to find ourselves in the camp of, yeah, it's been too long. Yeah, Peter says those kind of people are going to come. You guys have been preaching this for a long time, at least 2,000 years, and he still hasn't come back. Yeah, but he's coming. And he didn't give us a day, he didn't give us an hour, so that we would continue to work all the way through. So let's do that. And and let's remember. Let's remember what God's done for us. How he's changed our mind. How we've been moved from positions that were against God to positions that are putting us at his feet. Listening to his words. Studying his word ourselves. Applying it to our lives and going out with the hope that we're going to change our world. And when somebody comes to the Lord, celebrate. I don't know if everybody got the message, but Melinda's brother and sister-in-law gave their hearts to the Lord this week, finally. Dave and Melinda aren't here because she's getting baptized today. And so they went to her church, to the church that they go to, to be there and be a part of that, to celebrate that. Don't give up hope. Don't stop telling people. Don't let your failures be a reason to not speak. Hey, this guy could have been locked, could have just locked himself up, right? Say, well, you know, I did all this stuff. I scared people. I hurt people. I hurt myself. I did, I, I was, I did crazy things. And, you know, I probably am not the best mouthpiece for the Lord. You are. You're the mouthpiece of the Lord. Tell people about Jesus. Share. They're they're looking for hope. There are people out there looking for hope. And the world promises none. Tell them where to find the hope. And it's not in this church building. Man, if somebody wants to to know Jesus, you lead them to the Lord. I don't know. I've never done it. Just... Just do what you did. Pray with them. Tell them to ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. Explain to them that he is risen from the dead. Hey, go to Romans chapter 10. Read that with them. Go to Romans chapter 8. And the promises of him never losing them. Never being separated from them again. Share with him what changed your mind and changed your life and brought you to Jesus. Don't be afraid of your failures. He's delivering you from that or has already delivered you from that. That is that is your story. Without God, I was a huge failure. When I was a prodigal, when I knew better, and I walked away, and I got into the, the things of this world, I was in the wrong. But God changed me. He brought me back home, or he has your initial salvation. Share your story and watch. It's not your job to change the world. It's not your job to change someone's heart. It is your job to be obedient to God and speak. The Holy Spirit will change their heart. He's the one that changes them. And if they reject your story, they don't reject you. They reject God. And if they accept your story and they want their life changed because yours is, they're not accepting you. They're accepting Jesus. Make that clear. We don't save and we don't condemn. Everybody we speak to, we speak to with hope that they're going to embrace the hope of God, the hope of salvation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your words. Thank you for this account of dealing with this deliverance and the encouragement that one day we will completely overcome the things that we struggle with and wrestle with.
we can imagine the things that this this man wrestled with the the reputation that he had the things that he had done and said and lord may we respond the way he would respond and just say but jesus changed me Nor help us to be obedient. Give us the strength by the power of the Spirit to speak and say the words you would have us to say. And Lord, I pray that we would all be disciples, that we would study your word, that we would we ourselves would sit at your feet and listen and hear so that we have understanding, so that we can teach. Most of all, Lord, thank you for saving us. We look forward to the day when we will see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.